Welcome everybody once again to Crazy Canuck Trucking. I appreciate you stopping by and listening. We have a fantastic guest coming up today. And uh, before we get there, I want to remind everybody to uh, like the podcast, share it, talk about it with your friends, uh, put comments, send comments to me at crazycanucktrucken at gmail.com. And uh, check out the website. You can find all the uh, social media and everything through the website, crazycanottrucking.com. And uh, several years, several years ago, I guess it, it's uh, probably six or seven years ago, uh, before I had my last head injury, uh, I was listening to some TEDx videos. And uh, happened one happened to catch my eye because it was an acquaintance through Twitter, and uh, I listened to her TEDx, and it captivated me like no other TEDx. And I, I thought if I ever do a TEDx, then I want to talk to her, and I want to try and do something as good as she did because it was absolutely mesmerizing and um i was injured again and then i went through rehab and then i decided to uh start talking about my life and start talking about the challenges that i faced and wanted to try and give back a little bit to all the people that have helped me get to where i am and uh i know this is a long introduction but um i have to bring this up because the guest I have is that lady that I watched on TEDx, Adrian Ivy from Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming on, Adrian. And I've told you before that, you know, we have, I, when I was doing my own TEDx, I leaned on you a lot, talked to you a lot, and I really appreciate all the help that you were and still are. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for uh, inviting me to have this conversation. I'm so excited. Um, as I'm speaking, I'm just going to point out that we're getting some work done to our house. So if you hear some banging and crashing, it is the uh, roofers up shingling my house. So I apologize. <laughs> I thought they would have been done by today, but they're still going on. So uh, hopefully it doesn't get in the way of what we're going to talk about today. No, it, it should be all right. I can edit out some of that stuff anyway. So um, let's uh, go back into your history a little bit. Uh, so you're in Saskatchewan. Um, can't remember the name of the town. Ituna. Uh, Ituna. Ituna. It's a hard yes. one to forget for most people. Ituna. Yeah. It kind of rolls off the tongue. You were, uh, did you grow up in Ituna? I grew up um, about two hours north of here in northeast Saskatchewan in a town called Tisdale that I thought was a really small town growing up. Um, and there's prob probably about 4,000 people live in Tisdale. And then um, went to university, met a boy that brought me to Ituna. And then I realized what small town living really is. Because yeah, uh, yeah Ituna is about about eight hundred people, maybe. Yeah, and and because you're in the middle of nowhere, and this is something that you have talked about multiple times. Sometimes your video will shutter a little bit because internet service is not great in small areas. In in big areas with small populations. <laughs> right. Yeah, I apologize in advance for any internet glitches. They are an I'm going to say a daily part of our life here, but uh, more like a minute by minute part of our life and something we've learned to live with and kind of work around. But uh, yeah, frustrating. Definitely. I think you were, I, I'm kind of going off what I was, I, I wasn't meaning to go this way, but since we're talking about it, you were part of, you, you were going to be part of a call with the government talking about rural internet service and you couldn't get on or it was really bad it's like exactly what we are talking about it was it was with the federal government and i was zooming in it was during the you know the height of of the pandemic 
and I was zooming in to Ottawa from here in Ituna and they could not understand half of what I was saying because the internet connection was so bad, uh, which was unfortunate, but also kind of helped prove my point a little bit for sure. Exactly. I mean, it's like you're trying to, you're, you're complaining and it's, it's absolutely showing what's happening you know like it's famous when you have a vehicle that's not running right you take the mechanic all of a sudden everything's perfect right <laughs> always you know it's like i swear i sw this thing was not working right and oh we can't get it to do that well <laughs> you managed to get it your internet to act up you know and it but, but that's a common problem out in the boonies it is it so. is nothing if not consistently frustrating yes yes I'm fortunate I, I live kind of close to a big center, so my internet is not as bad. And of course, now we have the whole area is getting torn up because they're putting fiber everywhere. Oh. And uh, which is great, but I don't think I'm going to end up with fiber because I'm probably a half a mile away from where the fiber line is going. Oh, that's frustrating. Yeah, uh, fiber, a fiber line into my yard would be a dream. Like I can just yeah. picture how fast images would load and emails would send and all of the things. Yeah, that would be awesome. Yeah, yeah no, no lucky, you know, when I upload stuff for YouTube and different things, it's like I, I start it and then I walk away and I start doing something else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's like it's the old fun. adage that a watched pot never boils, and it's yeah. the same uploading anything to the internet in uh, in rural areas. Yep. So you grew up in Tisdale. What was I your did. childhood like? I grew up on a grain farm, um, solo grain farm, no livestock around other than um, some 4-H steers and uh, some show horses, because I grew up showing horses as a kid. Um, so yeah, met my husband in university and that's how I got into the cattle biz, which I'm not gonna lie, was a major eye opener. Um, there's definitely a lot of stress and work in all areas of farming, but livestock, anything that involves livestock just kicks it up an extra notch. Definitely. That was, that was a learning experience. You've had, uh, you've had a couple of rough years on the ranch. It has been. It's been uh, it's been a bit difficult. Last year was a drought that a lot of places in Western Canada, unfortunately, experienced. Um, and again, I was missing my days of grain farming through that drought because it's stressful enough when you aren't um, necessarily making any money. But it's extra stressful when you're trying to figure out how to keep your livestock healthy and happy throughout the winter months. Um, when feed supplies aren't there on your and own farm, you've been managing to just hit things. I hate to even say it out loud, but pretty good. Um, so things look, things look good right now. Good. Yeah. We lost you for a little bit there, but, um, yeah, you were going over the last couple of years, things were rough and that's, that's, I wonder how many people actually think about that, that, um, not getting a crop it's it's a lot more than just not getting a crop when you're running livestock because yeah. how do you how do you feed your cattle exactly it's the it's the stress of um you know making that plan of how you're going to keep everything fed for the winter um making the decision of when to pull the trigger if you should be selling animals knowing that you know, because lots of people are being forced to sell animals so that the prices are just absolutely in the tank. So you're almost giving them away. And these are these are creatures that you've cared for for years and that you have, um, you know, been building up your genetics and all of these things that it's very it's very emotional parts to it um, and not quite as quite cut and dried as just. Uh, the grain farming side of it, which we also grain farm, which is just, you know, work everything back to per acre. And it's a, more of a, it's more of a financial equation rather than an emotional thing. Yeah. So you run a, if I'm correct, you run a cow calf? 
Yeah, yeah. we have a uh, cow calf herd and we also keep all of our calves, background them for the winter and then run them as, as grazing yearlings the following year, own them right through until um, they're finished and process ready for processing. And then we also have a green farm as well, um, which up till now has been the smaller side of our farm, um, but uh, definitely been upsizing that in recent years and been downsizing the cattle a little bit. Again, just as more of a financial decision more than anything else. Yeah. So uh, for those that don't know, cow calf is going to, you're, it's not like a feedlot where you're bringing, you're bringing animals in. And then you're shipping them out right away or not right away, but you're shipping them out when they reach weight. And uh, so you have a lot of time. You have years built into your herd and to get rid of to get rid of animals is a really big deal because you have been working years, like you said, to get your genetics and to get everything to have the uh, cows that you want, the bulls that you want and keep improving. There's a lot of work in that. It's not an easy decision. Yeah, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears um, invested in every one of those animals. So, how do you how do you handle the stress of those of those days? What what do you find works for you? I think that it's been a long time progression for me, um, and I think that that's one thing where I'm so grateful to people um, sharing their experiences with managing stress and monitoring their mental health and things like that. Um, because I've learned so much in the past few years, which uh, you know has helped me, me personally immensely. Uh, but what I really try to think about is focusing on what can be done rather than focusing on the circumstances in. So uh, prime example, last year during the drought, I could have just focused on a daily basis of it's not raining today. It's not raining today. I don't, you know, uh, I don't have a clear path forward. Uh, I'm getting bogged down in, in that kind of negative thought cycle. So instead I focus on, well, what can we do uh, today if it's not raining today? So maybe we can use this opportunity to spend more family time. Uh, maybe we need to put more focus on planning for the future of what, of what steps we can be taking to prepare for a winter of not enough feed. Um, you know, having a plan just reduces my stress I'm a planner and a list maker. So things like that help me out on a daily basis. Um, and, and then I think the other huge part too is just uh, trying to do whatever I could to help my husband get through it as well, because uh, I've learned a lot about managing my stress. Um, he has spent less time in this area, so maybe hasn't had as much learning opportunities along the way. So if I could be a support to him was just as important to me as managing my own stress. That's something we haven't touched on yet. You are a mother with children and it's not, you not only have to manage the stress of the farm and what's happening and the weather, but you are raising children and that's the most important job there is. And so at the same time, you're trying to handle all that and raise your children as best as you can and help teach them and still be a still be an example for them yeah i think you hit the nail on the head that i that's actually one thing this whole sphere of of stress management a little bit easier for me actually is because i can step back out of it for a second and think about well what do i want my kids to learn from this and um there is no doubt in my mind that kids who learn throughout their childhood how to overcome adversity and, you know, how to help um, help themselves in any of the mental health aspect. I think that those are enormous lessons that will stick with them through life uh, and that bad things happen and things go wrong and you have bad years, but it's what you do about it that matters. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know, um, I'm pretty sure it was you 
I saw some social media posts last year that uh, you can't do anything about the drought, but because of the drought, it did free up some family time to go and do some vacationing or I, I don't know if I could call it vacationing, but talk yeah. about that, you know, cause it, that was something I noticed. Yeah. With you and other farm families. Absolutely. I think through last year's drought and also through the pandemic when, um, I mean, during the pandemic, when there was all the lockdowns, it was a lot, it was really stressful for a lot of people trying to manage through that. For us as adults on the farm, life honestly did not change that much. We still got up yeah. and had to go out and feed cattle every single day. You know, that doesn't change. But it was a huge issue for my kids and yeah. with it, not only their school being canceled, but all of their sports and activities and the things that they're passionate about. And so same with same with the drought. We use the pandemic as a way to, well, what are we going to do about it? Here's what's happening. We have no control over that. But what what do we have control over? And so we made sure through that time to spend as much family time as possible to find things that we could do rather than on focusing on what we couldn't do and maneuver through it that way, which um, which I think is is the blessing of having a family in those kinds of times, because, again, it's not just about me. It's not just about um, the bad things that are happening. It's how can we make this into a good thing instead of just bad? Yeah. No, and that that's, you know, people can say, well, you know, it, it costs money to do different things. There's so many things you can do with your children that don't cost you anything mm -hmm. except your time. And the best uh, thing only costs time usually. Yeah. And you can just have awesome family time just doing things with them and they can see a great example in their parents. On, and, you know, and honesty too, you know, I, I would assume that you're very upfront with your kids about how things are going and how it affects the bottom line, you know, and to see, to, to know, for them to know that and to see how you're handling it is, is huge. Great lessons. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and excuse me, I think that's the great part about the family kitchen table and dining table, sitting around and sharing meals together, um, perfect opportunities for really great conversations of just real talk about what's happening on the farm and in our lives, and even in the world. Yeah. How, how has it been um, locally for you uh, with the children in the area? Have, have they handled it, all the stress in the last Two and a half years fairly well um because I, I know i i talked to tara on the last episode and there's been some teen and children suicides there as well as in our area there's been um actually some of them are getting covered up but there's been several of kids younger than 14 committing suicide Oh, that's so heartbreaking. Um, I'm we're really fortunate in this area that we haven't uh, experienced a lot of of that with young people. Knock on wood, and hopefully it stays that way. But we are definitely seeing the effects of all these difficult times, um, and they're coming out in in ways that that some of us maybe predicted and in a lot of other kinds of ways that that are a surprise to everyone. Um, when I look at things like sports and activity enrollment, it is way down. Um, really? There's there's more kids than ever that are choosing to stay home and, you know, play video games, which was already a trend for sure. But it's just it's just blown it up that much more. Um, I think engage to speaking with teachers engagement in school is, is way down. Um, and you see kids that, you know, up till this point were, were good focused, um, ambitious teenagers. And now perhaps they've turned a bit of a corner and, and are a little bit more reclusive, definitely in general, teenagers seem less social than they used to be. Um, so yeah, it's it's tough when you just want to see your your teenagers out doing dumb teenager things and living their lives, right? Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, I, I remember that once as a, as a young, younger dad, I was given one of my, uh, my kids were acting up and being ridiculous. You know, I was trying to put them to bed and they were, they were nuts, you know, and, and I walk into the room and I, I start laying down the law. And then I, I realized in that moment that that was, you know, what they were doing wasn't causing any harm. They weren't going to sleep like I told them they had to, but I, I, I don't know what prompted it, but I had a bit of a flashback to my childhood and I was like, you know, that would have been kind of fun. And I was like, so I, I, uh, I turned around. Well, I, I, it was my three older girls. And I said, just try not to wreck anything. <laughs> and I went back downstairs and then everything was just quiet, you know, <laughs> cause they were just like, what's happened to dad? Where is he? You know? And sometimes that's, that, that's something I've used. I've tried to use many times for myself is remember what it was like being a child. Absolutely. And, and the fun that you can have. And sometimes it's a little noisy, you know, but, and it, with my head injuries, then that, that's been a really tough thing is handling noise, handling things like that and commotion. And um, I have purposely not kept my kids and my grandkids back from coming. There are times where I, I do have to say, okay, Oh, or I end up walking away or I go somewhere else and I have a big house so I can go into another area where it's quieter. I can lay down, whatever. But I don't want to ever tell my kids or my grandkids, don't come by. Don't be, don't be kids just because my head is having a hard time. And I want to learn to deal with it myself and also let them still be children, you know. Oh, you yeah. sound like the best grandpa ever. We have a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of fun. I oh, I don't have it in here. I have I have a mug that says world's best grandpa, like every grandpa out there, but Excellent. Um I'm a young grandpa. Yeah, you are. But, uh we have had another one, a granddaughter born uh just a few days ago. And she's like five pounds one ounce. Oh, so tiny and so i she's she's in ottawa and uh so my wife went there for a couple of weeks she gets to hold the baby and play with the baby and i i love i love if you can't tell i love kids i you know, think I, so fantastic yeah that that was again i'm going off script here a little bit that was one of the biggest things for me with my first uh really bad head injury in 91 where I should have died and nobody like I, I've said that in my TEDx and you've seen the TEDx where I say the best case scenario was that I would be a vegetable yeah and I uh I just say yeah they were kind of right because I look like Mr. Potato Head with <laughs> very little hair on top and a pudgy belly and <laughs> stick arms stick arms and legs you know oh my goodness I don't know about but, that but definitely that just goes to show how amazing modern is and uh and also never count yourself out right no no yeah that's not the only time in my life where I've been like I, I've, I've been told by multiple doctors multiple times because that's 91 was only the first head injury or the second head in, head injury but that and I've had a couple other since then and I was told I would even in 2016, I would probably never work again. And I managed to get back long haul. And uh, it was starting to get a little too much this winter. And I lucked into this job where I'm back to my roots, doing hauling pig feed to pig farmers and loving it. And uh, but we always, the, the body and what we have, each one of us is so amazing. And we need to just keep taking that and yeah. focus for me, it's 
focusing on what matters, you know, the grain I'm, farm or the feedlot or the cow calf operation can be doing bad, but instead you get more time to spend with your family. Right. And it all comes back to your health. And it all does. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, just, I, I love seeing all the, uh, pictures of you and your son. You're a goalie mom. <laughs> Which I, is a whole nother topic of managing stress right there. Anybody that, who's, there who's a goalie parent understands what I'm talking about. Well, that <laughs> is the worst. <laughs> In my mind, that is the worst is being a goalie parent. Yeah, uh, both of my kids are very active in a lot of sports, um, but I will definitely say, you know, between the volleyball and the curling and the horse showing and the football and, you know, soccer and ball and all the things over the years that they've played, there is definitely nothing quite as stressful as as being the goalie mom and uh, which has been pretty cool in teaching life lessons about you know, focus on what you can control. Don't focus on what's out of your control and always look for the next shot. Don't worry about what happened in the past. Always be looking forward. And yeah, it's um, super stressful, but also one of the greatest family learning lessons that uh, we could ever have imagined. He works so hard at it, at least from what I see. He, he, He works hard at it. He does. Uh, He's on the ice year round with his goalie coach, uh, works out every day in the gym. Um, Like he's 14 years old, uh, but he is so driven and, and he loves it so much. Uh, It's been, it's been really cool for both my kids in their perspective uh, passions to be able to watch them dedicate so much time and work and energy to the things that they love. Uh, I think that that's something that they get from farm life is uh, they live and breathe it every day that uh, whatever your passion is, that's great, but work hard. Uh, My husband and I, uh, that's, that's something that my kids get to see every day is when we're out on the farm, working on the farm, just how much, um, work and effort you should be putting into something that you're passionate about. And so now when my kids have the things that they're passionate about, whether it is hockey for my son or horses for my daughter or whatever, um, they really have this innate um, work ethic that really helps them when it comes to the things that they want to be successful at. That's amazing. You're such a good role model for your kids. Sometimes you and you and your husband, but hey, <laughs> you know, there. If you were perfect all the time, then you wouldn't be human. That's you right. You wouldn't be here. Definitely human. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's the other thing too that you don't want to shield your kids from is let them know that you are human. Yeah, right? yeah. There are and times we can't expect per- per- perfection of ourselves or of the people around us. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll close off here shortly. So what uh, you've been on many road trips, of course, when you live that far away from civilization, you're going to have lots of road trips anyway. So what is one that always comes to mind as an epic type of road trip? Um, so you're right. I've done a lot of really awesome road trips, uh, in the height of the pandemic, me and a bunch of girlfriends hopped in a vehicle and drove out to be British Columbia through the mountains. It was beautiful. Went wine touring, lots of stories from that, but what always strikes out in my mind as the best road trip of my life. Um, when I was a kid growing up, my grandparents had a winter house down in Southern Texas, right along the Mexican border. So as a family, we road tripped down one winter to go and see them and have a family visit. And I think that's the only time in my life where we took our time, stopped at every little point of interest, um, every cool little shop or museum or whatever along the way. And it was an in- it's an entirely different way of traveling when you're not in a hurry to get somewhere. And I've never been able to do that since, but 
it's something I really want to do again. Like now, you know, that my kids are teenagers and soon in a matter of years, I'll be an empty nester. Play the kind of road trip that I want to take where it's just meandering and stopping wherever you see fit and you end up where you end up that day. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm-hmm. Lots of good memories and stuff like that. So thank you very much, Adrienne, for your TEDx to start with, because that that really was an amazing TEDx to watch. And uh, thank you again for all the help that you were to me when I was trying to put mine together. Okay, but I just have to interject and say that yours was also amazing. And I feel like yours was so good because it really would have been an aha moment for a lot of people that have struggled with head injuries or different things like that, that, you know, that idea that, oh, I'm not the only person who's gone through this before. I'm not the only person who's struggled with this. So, so to you on an amazing job. Well, that, that is something that um, I've heard so many times with different things with concussions and head injuries and when I've talked about it people are like really I'm not the only one yes because there are so many uh, I have a speech that I've done that is a pebble in my shoe and uh you can that's how head injuries can be the after effects you know it's like a pebble in your shoe and you think that um you know if you go and see a doctor about a pebble in your shoe they're they're like if It's no big deal. Like, who cares? You know, even if it's something you can't get out, look at people that have no legs or have no arms, you know, like that pebble in your shoe is not a big deal. Except you have to live with it every day. You have to live with it every day. And then if you have another head injury, like I've been blessed to have, you know, I've had four serious head injuries, Mm -hmm. then you get multiple pebbles in your shoes and you learn to adapt. You learn to do things differently and uh calluses can build up around that pebble you know whatever but it it is a big deal when you're walking and something is poking you in the foot yeah and every day when i'm dealing with stuff from the head injury completely unseen stuff you know that um and that's how it is for many of us you know the the little things i've i can't tell you how many doctors have said to me who cares you know like that's not that big a deal you know and i'm like it's a big deal to me you know and it's hard to explain that so when i tell people that yeah that's what you have with your head injury and they're just like wow you know i met one lady in rehab um that uh she had never been told she had a concussion and she was 15 months I saw her 15 months after she uh, broke her face and a bunch of different things. And she had never been told any of this. And she was wondering why some things were just such a Herculean task for her. I'm like, well, you've had a head injury. Yeah. And she's just like, what? That light bulb moment. It made such a huge difference in her life. Yeah. She ended up getting... uh, breast cancer and we were sit, sitting down talking six months six nine months after after uh she got out of rehab for her head injury and stuff then uh she said i need to talk to you and so I was like, okay let's sit down and talk and so i met her in the city and we we're talking and just as we're getting ready to leave she's like oh yeah by the way i have breast cancer i'm like what i mean you're waiting till now to tell me this (laughs) and she's like yeah david it's no big deal she says after what i learned in rehab and what you told me and how we can work through our problems this is nothing i'll be i'll be fine oh that is such a good outlook i was just like wow and she's alive and well today amazing she's she's an amazing lady but change that mindset right right so it's fantastic to see you face to face yeah back at you in real life 
You are an amazing mother, rancher. Where do people find you? Uh, view from the ranch porch, right? And I'm definitely most active on Instagram now, less so on Twitter. Kind of Twitter got to be a little bit of a negative space. So yeah. um, Instagram's become my jam and where I hang out most often online now. And I'll put that on the, in the show notes. So if people want to follow your stuff, then they can check you out there. You do some public speaking as well and travel around to different things. So awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's a great chat.